when Twitter throttled the story, search interest on Google in the story skyrocketed. And so you can compare the timeline of Twitter throttling the story and the search interest on Google, and the search interest went way, way, way up, which is exactly predictable mm -hmm. according to anyone who has experience with censorship in a free state, <laughs> that mm -hmm. censorship tends to magnify interest which yeah. also applies to the CRT bands, but yeah. <laughs> but the frustrating thing to see in that correspondence was the fact that they really did seem to be kind of inventing rationales on the fly um, and looking for reasons to take an action that satisfied, perhaps satisfied the, the biases of particular people within the institution. Um, and there did appear to be some correspondence before this happened um, between Twitter and um, some government agencies who were advising them that they ought to be on the lookout for certain kinds of misinformation. So they've been primed to expect this, which, you know, on one level, okay, that's disconcerting. But on another level, it sounded like a, it sounded like a generic warning. And yeah. this was Trump's um, Justice Department that was essentially issuing these warnings. Uh, and I don't believe that that was issued with the expectation that the Hunter Biden laptop story right. was going to come out eventually. So again, even there, I saw when there was discussion about this, a lot of conflation of some of those things. Um, but, you know, that, I think that's my general take. I mean, I think with Trump um, and January 6th, on the other hand, um, I... I have very mixed feelings about it. I think what I saw, I can appreciate why some company might have made a decision to remove the president uh, from social media at that period of time. What I found disconcerting was the kind of coordinated nature of the behavior amongst all of these different private institutions. There was no directive from the government, um, but there was this kind of internal, these discussions that were happening between various people, the, their counterparts in different companies. And they all essentially seem to make these decisions in lockstep to remove the president from all of the things. And we've actually seen it happen a few times with a couple of high profile people. Um, Andrew Tate uh, comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, Gavin McGinnis is another. Um, Alex I'm sure Jones. there are others. Alex Jones is another. Yeah. And I think in general, that's something that ought to be more disconcerting to us. And in general, I think that it would be good if we had a, a cultural disposition that said, we don't think people are, are idiots. We don't think merely having access to things that are, you know, perhaps dishonest, um, less than true, or I should just say perhaps false, um, or even might cate be categorized as incitement are necessarily, you know, the going to perpetuate the fall of the, of the Republic. Um, but on the other hand, if we develop an appetite or at least uh, too much of a familiarity or an expectation that people will be wholesale deleted from the internet when they are suspected of having done something bad or suggesting something sinister, that could actually lead to much worse outcomes mm -hmm. um, in my estimation. So while you know Twitter has every right to make the decision they made, I think in general, um, all of it was kind of a, a bit of a dark omen. Um, and I, I'd like to think that we are being a bit more thoughtful about how we proceed with things like that going forward and that there will perhaps be less of an inclination to make that sort of decision. I remember um, when there was a moment where I believe it was CBS News decided that they were no longer going to tweet shortly after Elon took control of Twitter and things started to go a bit crazy. <laughs> right. And everyone kind of looked at them a bit odd. And that lasted about 24 hours and then they reversed the decision. Yeah. Um, and that seems appropriate to me. Yeah. So I, I have an interesting, uh, I, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, I have some thoughts on the Trump uh, saga that are related to an actual interaction that I had with, how can I be clear yet vague, a very high level person in social media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm talking to this very high level person in social media and I was making the pitch that I've been making for years, which is, look, don't try to reinvent the wheel on free speech. If you want, if you, if you have a platform where you want free speech to be protected, it's to be a cardinal virtue on your platform. And not all platforms are like that. Like if you, if you're building like a dating platform, that's Christian mingle, well, you could say, well, 
you know, we're, we want, we want this to be Christian content, right. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you're making sure. a platform where we're opening to everybody and we want to have, um, you know, a dialogue and discourse, I said, why, why don't go down the path of the speech code, go down the path of the first amendment. Colleges spent decades with this speech code nonsense, trying to figure out a way to have all of the best of free speech and none of the bad. Right. And it was a giant mess the speech codes were never upheld. The, the stories you could tell about speech codes were just would, you know, put your, make your hair stand on end. It's just very, very difficult. Use the First Amendment as your touchstone. And it's making this case. And then this question was raised. I hear you. Um, that's got a lot. There's a lot to that. But we operate in places overseas where actual civil unrest will erupt because of what's being shared on social media. People get hurt and are killed. And and they said, would, would you just want us to let that? And I said, well, you know, I, look, there is a, unlike the government, which can protect speech and also impose order. In other words, the government should, one of the ways you protect speech is by imposing order, right? Social media companies have no tools to impose order. Um, and if actual disorder is breaking out and you discern it's because of speech on your platform, um, I, you know, th there are emergencies where you can and should throttle to prevent people killing each other in the real world. And when I was talking about that, I was thinking of like riots that we've seen pop up in places, you know, overseas uh, that are torn by civil strife. I mean, you know, I think of as, uh, a country like Mali, where there has been civil war, you know, and civil strife and, and uh, or other countries where I've seen, not necessarily Mali, but I've seen riots break out because of, and, and I was thinking of sort of that, that situation. I was not thinking that that could ever apply to the U.S. <laughs> and my concern after January 6th is that we were seeing this unfold in the U.S. and that there was um, violence breaking out in our in our capital as a result of um, what we were seeing on social media. So I was I was very much in favor of at least the temporary suspension of Donald Trump under that reasoning that what we were seeing was a violent reaction that was being that was being stoked via social media. Um, and even when I wrote it, I wrote about this and I felt torn, even as I was putting the words to paper on this, um, because I'm, as you know, Camille, we're both free speech advocates. Um, but once the violence was breaking out and Facebook had no ability to impose order in the streets, <laughs> Twitter had no ability, uh, but what could it do to throttle the violence? Uh, that was what I was thinking. And I'm still not a hundred percent convinced I was right about that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah.